There's nothing much to say. Let's just start taking it apart right now. Here are four hex socket screws, Joe G's signature style. Put the four screws aside and the back cover should be able to be pried off. Very easy. There's a cushioning foam pad, and then a hexagonal dust filter. This joystick should still be the newer type, the ball or semi-spherical kind. This is actually my first time taking apart this kind of machine. Can the shoulder buttons be removed? Let's take off the shoulder buttons first. The circuit board for the shoulder buttons is also attached vertically, just like the later versions of the 3-4 Cross models. It's separated from the main board, which I think is to increase durability. Remove this latch, and then carefully lift up the ribbon cable. There is a piece of tape between the fan and the heat sink. We use tweezers to remove it. All right, we don't need to take it off completely since we'll have to put it back on later. About disconnecting the battery, how should I put this? I got a little too excited today. Ideally, as soon as you're able to, you should disconnect the battery first. Of course, this machine hasn't even been powered on yet. I don't even know if it can turn on. I'm going to remove this heatsink. Brother Joe also used thermal paste here, but there's a bit too little of it. I'd suggest that next time, Brother Joe, you could apply a bit more because it doesn't seem to be fully covered. Looking at the metal fins, ah, the metal heatsink, there's only a little bit on it. This is the CPU, but there's very little thermal paste on top of the CPU. We'll add some more ourselves later on. Now let's remove the fan as well. Since we're taking off the cooling system, we should take off the whole set. The cooling system is held in place with two screws. There's also a ribbon cable here. Let's lift it up from both sides. All right, it's off. This is a small fan, five volts and 0.1 amps. Honestly, my memory isn't great. I can't remember if this is the same model as the fan on the 557 or if it's the same as the ones from Joe's other devices. I haven't really paid close attention to that. I feel like the fan is something I tend to overlook. Let's set the fan aside as well. Next, we'll remove the joystick. At this point, we need to lift up the latch on the base of the joystick. Now the joystick can be taken off. Uh, it really is the same kind of semi-spherical joystick that Joe uses a lot in his later models. I wonder if this type of joystick can be swapped onto other models. We can try that out as an experiment later. Let's take another look. There's really nothing else left to remove here. Then it's the battery. Pry it off. Alright, we've taken it out. Actually, there's a thin little metal contact and a small plastic plate underneath it. So removing this battery is actually pretty easy. It's only held in place by adhesive on both sides. At this point, we can see that this is the display cable. The display cable comes through here, and its connector is clipped underneath. Then over here, there's another cable. I'm not sure what it's for. Maybe for the vibrator? Probably. We can leave that for now and focus on removing the motherboard first. Let's turn it over again. There is a Wi-Fi antenna seat here. Pry it off. We continue to tighten the screws. There are relatively more screws on this motherboard. Check to see if all the screws have been removed. We can push this slider to see how the ribbon cable moves inside. Look, this is what the ribbon cable looks like. 
When there's battery pressure here, it gets pushed down, and when it's retracted, it's in a pulled-in state. Then, as soon as you open it, it gets pushed out. When prying up this motherboard, we still need to be careful. This really is a vibrator, and it's fixed onto the outer shell. So we still need to remove this flex cable. This is the vibrator's flex cable. Next, we flip the motherboard over, and here is the screen's flex cable. This one uses a snap-on method. The previous ones all used a latch. You push it in and then cover it. But this one is completely a snap-on style. All right, at this point, we've also removed the motherboard. We can see that, as usual with Brother Joe's designs, there are four small corners, which makes it especially easy to modify with micro switches, right? If you think that a slider phone like this should have that micro switch feel, it's pretty easy to modify. Just solder a few small micro switches on. As for the feel of the double S key this time, I actually think it's pretty comfortable, so there's really no need to modify it. Over here is the TF card slot. This is the microphone, and on this side are the volume and power buttons. If we flip it over to the other side, as you just saw, this is the CPU, and the memory, well, I guess you could call it the hard drive. There are also these connectors here. What are these connectors for? I have absolutely no idea. Overall, the level of integration on Brother Joe's motherboard is still pretty high, but it's not as high as his RG Cube. The RG Cube just has this tiny little board. Actually, I think this machine was probably designed this way because of the space needed for the two joysticks in the middle. Otherwise, a single board in the center would have been enough, and then you could just have two small subboards on each side. So, more or less, I guess the shape of the device dictated this design. A lot of these design compromises are really just to serve the appearance. Let's go ahead and remove this conductive tape. Joe's device uses two types of conductive pads. You can see that one is darker and the other is lighter. The darker one is for the D-pad side, and the lighter one is for the ABXY side. The lighter one is a bit softer, and the darker one is a little harder, but overall, they're both soft. Here's the D-pad, then the ABXY buttons, and the one on the side is the volume up and down button, which has already fallen off by itself. Next, we need to separate the top and bottom covers. I guess it should be these screws here. These four screws have a non-slip design on the back, kind of like they each have their own washer. All right, there's a magnet here. This magnet is probably used to control the opening and closing of the screen when sliding the cover. Oh, did I forget to take off the double buttons just now? Yeah, that's right. Okay, the double buttons are off now too. Hey, looking at it from this angle, have you ever checked it out like this? After taking it apart, this, what do you call it? A, B, C, it's the C side, right? I think so. About two-fifths of the top area is for securing the screen of the sliding cover, and the bottom three-fifths is the button area. And this here is the sliding mechanism. We can see the entire sliding mechanism here. You can see how the spring works inside. Let's take off this panel. This time it's secured with Torx screws. Now let's see if we pry this up. Can we take it off? Can't lift it. Maybe there are still some clips holding it. Or maybe not. Could it be that these screws are also helping to hold it in place? <laughs> okay, since it's held in place by a stopper, once that's removed, this part comes right out. This is a solid steel plate. Let's try using a magnet on it. Yep, it's magnetic, so it's definitely steel. Sometimes, you really can't tell what material something is just by looking at it. How do I pry this off? This should be pried from the edge. After all, the screws have been removed. This seems to be a breakthrough.
It's clipped in all around the edges. Oh, this is really tough to deal with. Let me try this tool. Okay, this pry bar is still useful. Okay, with the help of the pry bar. Oh, the back side of this is just that kind of clip structure. Let's gently separate it. Then remove the buckle. All right, now the screen can be separated. This is what the back looks like. On both sides, there are two buttons which correspond to the two buttons on the front of the screen. And this is the screen's ribbon cable. So if the ribbon cable on this device breaks, if this cable breaks, you can just replace this module to repair it. Hey, that's actually pretty good. You don't have to replace the entire screen's ribbon cable, so it's not bad at all. Then, on both sides of these two raised parts, there are two gold fingers, contact points, which are the speaker contacts, responsible for transmitting sound from the speaker. This is the button on the front of the speaker. The buttons on both sides are exactly the same. And this whole speaker unit is probably stuck on top, right? Ah, uh, yes, this is a complete speaker module. It's snapped on top, not glued. And as for the rest, it's just this, this screen here. There's only this one screen on top. This screen is laminated onto the A side, so I'm not going to take it apart, because I'm really worried I might break it and not be able to put it back together. Plus, the laminated area is pretty big. If it were just the screen in the middle, I might have tried to take it apart, but with both sides being this wide, I bet there's glue all around. That's it for today's teardown and reveal for everyone. Overall, I have to say I'm a bit disappointed. The quality and craftsmanship of Zhou Ji's product isn't as good as I expected, and it's a bit on the large side. But aside from that, the rest is actually pretty decent. The internal design and structure show a fair amount of thought, especially this sliding rail and this steel plate. It really is steel, so no wonder it's heavy. This part is aluminum. This is an aluminum plate. Place. I guess Shogu had to make some trade-offs for the sake of cost, which is why it ended up like this. Of course, I hope there might be an upgraded version in the future, right? Maybe the size could be made a bit more compact. Of course, if you want to enlarge the screen, you can do that. But do you think the two keys above are useful? They're not that useful. The speaker could be moved to the bottom, and then the entire top panel could be turned into a screen. Actually, everyone still prefers a higher screen-to-body ratio, right? If the device size stays the same but the screen-to-body ratio is higher, I think people would find it more acceptable. That's it for today's unboxing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.